Uh, so good morning, everybody. The uh, I've slightly changed the um, <coughs> the slides that um, are on the um, the E class. So um, you you may want to check um, if you're missing one of the slides or something. Um, should be easy to recognize. One of the changes I made it was um, was due to a remark of uh, one of you. Um, came to me after class and uh, asking if one of the um, remarks I made uh, was correct. So on slide 38, uh, in the slide you probably have uh, copied from uh, or printed from uh, the e class site, you'll see that um, I said or I write alloying element can re result in lattice contraction, and then I wrote silicon, and then the original has um, aluminum, I think. Doesn't it? Uh, that's uh, wrong. Aluminum should be here with uh, the lattice expansion, and it, instead it's phosphorus that I, I meant to write. But uh, whoever it was, I don't remember who it was, but um, had uh, probably heard about the lightweight steels, lightweight steel research, and, and it was kind of uh, strange to him that uh, aluminum would be in the lattice uh, contraction group. Um, so this is some information here, just if you're interested. Um, so alloying elements that result in lattice contraction or um, expansion, that's related to the, uh, uh, the, the size of the atom relative to that of iron. So um, you, I, I will post this um, a, a new version of the uh, slides uh, for the introduction on E-class, so you'll, you'll be able to find it um, in the, this afternoon already. Um, and um, so these are, this is the periodic table of elements and uh, the elements that are indicated are the, the main alloying elements in steels. And uh, I've indicated um, the atomic radii. So iron is, um, is actually a relatively small, dense um, element um, uh, as they come. One uh, point... Uh, uh, 120.124 um, uh, nanometers, uh, manganese about the same size, and then the green elements are the ones that are um, uh, larger in size, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the um, orange ones are the ones that are uh, smaller in size. Um, and of course, it's what you expect. Uh, some of the things are expected. Uh, aluminum is, is uh, you can see here, um, considerably larger in size, even though it's lighter yeah? uh, uh, um, uh, element. And, uh, and so as a consequence, if you, um, if you alloy, uh, let me go back just a second here. And, and in, in contrast, silicon, which is sent next to it, is uh, considerably smaller, yes? So, so if you alloy uh, iron, the ferrite, with uh, aluminum, uh, you and you measure the lattice parameter. Hmm? So you measure the the lattice parameter here. This the the distance between these two atoms in the uh, unit cell hmm? of ferrite. Um, when you alloy with aluminum, you'll have considerable expansion of the lattice. If you alloy with silicon, you'll have contraction. Uh, these two elements, atoms being lighter than iron, uh, this means alloying with uh, aluminum will give you a, a density a decrease. Uh, this one with silicon will have, give you an increase in density this, despite the fact that the uh, silicon is um, smaller. 
Okay. So, so thank you very much for uh, noticing this, and uh, so you've got some additional material to learn as a consequence. <laughs> so, uh, right, good. So, so let's continue now, where um, with lecture. So we had talked about UTEC transformation, and the we had, uh, if I'm right, we had started with the discussion of the kinetics and discussed about growth and uh, so again we cover a lot of material because I assume that at one time of, of, or another most of you uh, would have um, seen this mat uh, material and, and we had ended with um, introduction of spher spheroidite which ha which is the microstructure you get if you take um, a steel, an iron carbon alloy, um, and you uh, anneal for a very long time, and you get the, f the, the um, um, equilibrium microstructure, which consists not of this lamellar uh, structure, but of these, these globules of uh, cementite, these small globules of cementite here in, and you see these larger grains here in the in ferrite grains. So that's that's actually the uh, equilibrium microstructure. It's a very soft microstructure and there are many uh, uh, steels that are not used in this with this microstructure but you use this microstructure to make them softer so you can process them. You can uh, plastically, easily plastically deform them. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of um, products that go through this microstructure, yes? Uh, ball bearings, for instance, or uh, fasteners, uh, bolts, will, will go, will pass through this microstructure before getting their, their final microstructure because this is a, a very soft intermediate microstructure. Uh, finally, you can also, um, instead of um, uh, doing the transformation from austenite to room temperature or lower mm, uh, by quenching, and so that uh, uh, you get a transformation that where there's absolutely no diffusion and you know that um, this transformation leads, to, this transformation is called Martensitic, diffusionless transformation, and depending on the carbon content, you, you, your uh, cubic cent, your cubic uh, unit cell can become a, a tetragonal um, crystal structure if there is a lot of carbon in supersaturation. Uh, this will lots of carbon. That means that you typically have more than 0.2 percent of carbon then you will see this uh, tetragonal distortion, lower carbon contents, you do not see it. Um, and, and this is an example here of a martensitic microstructure. This is a, a high carbon martensite microstructure and you, you can see this very typical um, uh, martensitic uh, microstructure. Hmm? Let's have, hmm? now this, um, the martensitic transformation in, in steels, hmm? um, certainly in technical st in, in engineering steels, um, is um, the kinetics depend only on the temperature, not, not on time. And we say that this kind of transformation is called an athermal mar uh, uh, transformation. Hmm? Uh, what, what does this mean? This means if, uh, so you remember the, um, uh, the transformation to perlite, so, so if I do a transformation, for instance, using this temperature uh, cycle where gamma decomposes to perlite, yeah? and, and perlite is basically a mixture of ferrite plus uh, cementite, right? That is a growth, a nucleation and growth process. So it's, t it's the kinetics are both uh, time and temperature dependent, right? It's if I if I'm at a certain temperature, the transformation have this S-type uh, form uh, kinetics. Right? 
Um, not so in the Martin-Sittig transformation. And uh, Martin-Sittig transformation is only depends on the on the temperature. Hmm? So as a consequence, uh, the transformation for Martin side are horizontal lines. Yes, horizontal lines. If if you go you you quench down to this temperature, you make a little over 50 percent of the martensite is transformed, excuse me, 50% of the austenite is transformed to martensite. And if you stick to this temperature, nothing will happen. You will not make more martensite, yes? Basically, the, the situation is frozen. If you want to make more martensite, you, have, you will need to decrease to, so if you want to have 90% or more martensite, you'll have to cool down further, yes? So it's, Time independent. That's an important uh, aspect of the um, transformation. Having in, in, um, for, for most steels. Now, having said this, there are many different types of uh, martensites, uh, martensite transformations that, that do um, uh, behave in this way uh, by nucleation and growth, but, but um, the martensites you deal with in steels is a thermal martensite. Okay, and um, the, the, the usual microstructures that we see is very fine. It's a, it's a, this is what we call low carbon lath martensite. It's very complex. Yes, it's complex, and there, there's a lot of microstructure involved here, and um, um, and the reason is is because. Um, when you do a transformation from uh, austenite to ferrite, hmm? austenite to ferrite, hmm? you transform a unit cell of austenite to a unit cell of oops, unit cells of Um, you, uh, this, the unit cell of austenite can transform to multiple, in fact, 24 different but equivalent orientations for ferrite. Yes? And this happens all the time. So a, a typical austenite grain will be subdivided into uh, um, equivalent but differently oriented um, martensite unit cells. And that's, that is the reason why, uh, one of the reasons why the, the structure is uh, considerably refined. So one big uh, austenite grain gives rise to what we call uh, uh, packets, yeah, packets, yes, um, and these packets themselves are subdivided in what we call blocks, yes, and the blocks themselves consist of parallel laths, yes. And it's, so you get a considerable refinement of the microstructure. And although martensite is basically nothing else than ferrite in crystallographically, because you get this very uh, large refinement of the microstructure, martensite tends to be harder than ferrite, yes? Um, the, the concept that martensite is hard and brittle um, um, is strictly spoken not correct. Yeah? Martensite can be, it's, martensite is the result of a martensitic transformation, hmm? which is a diffusionless transformation. So it doesn't mean that the, the martensite constituent has to be brittle and hard. The brittleness and the hardness of the martensite is mainly the consequence of the very high carbon contents that you have in supersaturation. If you have very low carbon martensite, it's pretty soft. Hmm? Okay. 
and it doesn't have to be brittle, really. Uh, okay. Um, right, so this is an example of high carbon martensite. So do you see the microstructure is very different. You still see these uh, very la large um, lats of uh, martensite in this case. And then in between, you see regions where this, the, the, that are very smooth and gray. That is austenite that hasn't transformed and will not transform. Yes? It's what we call retained, untransformed, or retained austenite. And it's, it's the proof that the martensitic transformation is time independent because this, this uh, untransformed austenite will stay there forever unless I cool down this microstructure to sub-zero temperatures. And that will create more martensite. Okay? So you can have this retained austenite, say, if this particular um, So this is a particularly high carbon uh, steel. Mm -hmm. um, if, I, if I cool it like this, I will get transformation products like ferrite and, and cementite. Yes. If, I, if I cool down to uh, lower to room temperature, um, in this particular case, the MS temperature is here and the MF temperature is there. Right? MF is the martensite finish temperature. That's when everything is transformed. So at, for this particular steel, I transform to room temperature. Yes. Um, from the image here, probably 50% is transformed to, uh, to martensite. Yes. The rest is untransformed, right? And it doesn't matter how long I keep it at room temperature, this austenite will not transform. Yes, if I want to make uh, uh, everything martensitic, I will need to cool down. Yes, so the martensit, the kinetics of the martensit site transformation are not time dependent. Yes, no, no time dependence. No? Okay, now the the structure itself, yeah, is um, is um, is formed by a shearing process. Hmm? So the, the austenite transforms to ferrite by a shearing process. Hmm? And so uh, this would be the stacking here of uh, uh, 111 planes in austenite, yes? And, and you can see here on this side, you have a 111 plane, yes? Um, the, uh, the shear is presented here. So uh, this side here of 111 uh, this 111 plane becomes a straight, uh, a straight flat plane. It's not inclined anymore, and that's done by every uh, plane of atoms being sheared in equal amounts. Yes. Okay. And this um, shearing will will cause the structure. Uh, the crystal structure to change from um, FCC to BCC lattice. All right. What what you see at on the macro scale depends very much on the on the steel that you have. Hmm? For instance, uh, this is a larger magnification of this high carbon steel. Hmm? Uh, you can see the martensite lat. This is iron manganese. Yes. The, the martensite that you form here is, is much more plate-like. Hmm? Okay, so the type of martensite we get is um, very different. In, now, this uh, uh, martensite, you know, when there is enough carbon in it, hmm, will form a, you know, a high-strength constitu high constituent. Hmm? Which we, which we use in many engineering steels, yes? Um, and this um, very widespread use of martensite uh, microstructure 
uh, in steels. Uh, 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 is, is connected with a concept that's called hardenability. Yes? And hardenability concept is, is, a, describes, is a description of how easy you can make martensite microstructure in a steel. Yes? So let me show you how we measure hardenability first. Okay? You do, in, uh, in uh, technical circumstances, you use what's called a uh, uh, standardized hardenability test. And th the most famous one is called the Jomini end quench test. Yeah? But there, there are alternatives. But let's have first look at the, this Jomini test. Hmm? So what you do is you make this, you take this bar here. You can see it's a, it's a cylindrical bar of steel yes, during this test. It's uh, red hot. You make, put it in a, surf, in a, excuse me, in a furnace to a temperature where it's fully austenized, austenitized, 900 degrees C typically. Yes. And then you put it into this holder. Yes. Point take down. Yes. And then you have a water jet that quenches the end of the cylindrical bar. You, you can see here. This is the the water. Uh, flow, the water jet spreading sideways as you, as you quench the top. And the quenched end uh, is black here, yes, because it's colder, and you see gradually the black, the dark end uh, increases in size as you cool down this, uh, this bar, right? So um, you have cooling rates, which are very high on the quench end, and decrease as you go away from the uh, quenched end. Yes? So, uh, what, what you usually then do, you take this sample out when it's cooled down. Yes? So this is the sample viewed sideways. This was the uh, end that's quenched. And you make a hardness measurement. Yes? And what you usually find is that uh, a steel will have a very high hardness where the steel has been quenched, yes? So if I have cooling rates here are very high, and the cooling rates here in the bar are much lower. A cooling rate. So in, at, at the quench end, I have this cooling rate somewhere away from the quenched end, I have this cooling rate. So for this particular steel, yes, I will form here, I will form martensite, yes, and here I will form ferrite and cementite mixture, yes? For instance, bainite or perlite. However, if I have a steel um, so again, room temperature here, and I have the same cooling rates. This cooling rate at this point, and this cooling rate at so much lower cooling rate. Yes, at this point. Yes, but the steel I'm using has different transformation kinetics. Has a different TTT diagram, and. For instance, it has this TTT diagram. The transformation, the decompositions, uh, reaction, the C curves for the decomposition are on to the right. Yes? So as a consequence, the same cooling rates, I will get martensite here, and it will get martensite there. So we say this steel is, has a higher hardenability than this steel. Yes? Okay. Alternatively, you, you can do it with this uh, quenched end uh, specimen. You c there are also uh, quench tests where you use a cylindrical bar, yes, and you spray water on all sides. Yeah? So it's quenched on the outer side, and in the interior, the cooling rate is lower. So if you take, 
the sample, you then make a hardness test. Usually you'll find that the surface is hardened and then the center has, is, is less hard because there's less martensite there. Hmm? Or you've made constituents that are not so hard. Hmm? Okay? The, again, so this, this, uh, these tests are very standardized and, um, and they're used in the, in the following way. For instance, example here uh, of how, how you work with um, this uh, achomini test. Hmm? Uh, so let's have a look at three steels hmm? Hmm? Which, which contain 0.4% of carbon. 0.4%, uh, 0.2 to 0.3, 0.4% of carbon is a, is a normal carbon content in engineering steels. Hmm? Uh, and um, so we have three grades, the, and, and the, the grade denominations that I'm using here, we'll talk about this in, um, uh, later on uh, about standardization. So it's a so-called AISI uh, grade denomination, is the 1040, the 8640 steel, and the 40... 340 steel and uh, the 40 obviously is related to this 0.4 carbon is this, these last two digits is 100 times the carbon content in, in mass percent hmm? uh, and, and then the, the other digits are related to the composition okay so, so this one is a unalloyed steel it doesn't contain much of uh, alloying uh, much in terms of alloying element except carbon um, the second steel here, 8640, contains some chromium and some molybdenum. And uh, the last one, 4340, contains a lot more manganese, 0.8 chromium, and 0.25 moly. Yes? And you can see that if you measure the hardness, this is a Rockwell C hardness scale, yes? as a function of the distance from the quenched end, you see that all of them are martensitic at the surface, yes, at the surface of my Chomini test, yes, because I have very high cooling rates, yes. However, as we go away from the quenched end, the cooling rate decreases, and the unalloyed steel is very sensitive to this, yes. The cooling rate is too low to get hard martensite formed away from the quenched end because you have this behavior. If you have lower cooling rates, you form softer constituents, ferrite, uh, perlite, things like that, bainite, that are softer than martensite. So you get a very big drop in the um, um, hardness. Uh, the top one is almost insensitive to the cooling rate. I can, I can be at the quenched end, yes, but very far from the quenched end, I still have pretty appreciable uh, hardness. So this material is very hardenable, yes. And the intermediate one here, the 8640, hmm, uh, uh, I can see that it drops off, yes. And, uh, and this is the, the hardness. Yeah? Now, I can relate... Uh, the hardness, hmm, because I measure hardness, I don't, when you measure the hardness, you don't measure, you don't uh, holographically analyze the microstructure. You just measure hardness. However, we can relate hardness with the amount of martensite that's formed. Yes? Hmm. So this is, this is this plot here. So this is the, uh, the, uh, uh, Rockwell C scale, yes, and this is carbon content, all right, okay. and so let's just have a look at 100% martensite, yeah, that's 99% martensite microstructure, and what we see is that as we increase the carbon in the martensite, yes, the hardness increases. Yeah, so so uh, if I have very low carbon in the martensite, it's a soft martensite. Yeah. If I have a lot of carbon, like point, 
a seven, yes, the hardness very high. Okay. Okay. So the um, so if if we look at this point here, yes, the microstructure is uh, fully martensitic, yes, fully martensitic, yes. So microstructure fully martensitic, yes. 0.4 carbon, yes. So 0.4 carbon, fully martensitic. This is the hardness. Okay, that's that's why I know that here it's fully martensitic because of the hardness, not not because somebody's told me, but because I can I know here if I have 0.4 carbon, yes, uh, I I should have about a little bit over 65, uh, uh, sorry, 55. Uh, Rockwell hardness. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, uh, so what does it mean here? What is the what is the martensite content here? Yes. For instance. Okay. So let's have a look. I I look at the scale of the Rockwell hardness. Yeah. So this is the hardness I measure. Yes. And this is my carbon content, and they intersect on 50% of martensite, okay? So this means here at a depth of about half an inch, about 1.2 uh, uh, centimeters, yes, I will have 50% of martensite, okay? That's what it means. So um, with this um, uh, Jomini test, you can very conveniently describe the hardenability of a material, compare the hardenability, and also say, you know, how much martensite you've made um, at a particular spot. And so with this grade, the 8640, uh, I have 50% martensite at a distance slightly larger than half an inch away from the quenched end. Okay? All right. Okay. Now, obviously, um, you, uh, there are very few engineering products that, that look like Jomini bars. Actually, there are very, you know, not, not many I can think of, yes? Uh, so that's a standardized test. Very often, the products um, uh, where you use the hardenability concept are bar-like products. Bar-like products. What's a bar-like product? Well, for instance, this here. The crankshaft of a motor. And that's a very uh, common uh, uh, application for um, um, bars, yes, and for engineering steels. Hmm? Okay, so all, your, all the cars have uh, one of these, and there are other products that look like this in the powertrain of, of cars, which are bar-based, yes? So how do we relate um, the result of the, um, uh, the Jomini test with this bar diameter, yes? Okay. And does this have an impact on the, um, on the steels that are uh, used? Uh, first of all, uh, so that's, that's one point, right? okay? So uh, the relation between distance from quenched end and bar diameters, yes? The second thing we, um, we have to realize is that uh, when we um, uh, do a quench test, yes, with the uh, Jomini, it's very simple. You have uh, water at room temperature, yes? and you uh, basically uh, jet it against the surface of your uh, bar. So you have extremely high cooling rates. Yes? Mm -hmm. Now, technically, there are many reasons why you don't do this. Your, the cooling rates that you apply, the, the cooling uh, uh, media that you apply, are not as severe. Yes, and the, one of the reasons why we don't do this is, for instance, to avoid the formation of small cracks. And when you have, uh, so you have a massive bar, yes, and you cool it, 
what happens? And you cool it, uh, you get a very severe cooling. The outer end, the outer end will contract. Yes, it will contract because of thermal uh, contraction. The inside is not as cold, so it doesn't contract at the same rate. So as a consequence, you get tensile stresses at the surface. And they may be very high if you cool very severely. So you may for have cracks, and you don't like cracks. You certainly don't like cracks in crankshafts because you've got fatigue, uh, uh, fatigue effects uh, and, and you may get, for instance, uh, breakage, fracture, uh, fatigue fracture as a consequence of these cracks. So there are many reasons why we don't want to do very severe um, cooling. The other th reason um, is that uh, when you do this kind of severe cooling, you may also get distortion, thermal distortion. So you did many reasons why uh, very often we don't do what is called an ideal quench. An ideal quench is a extremely hard, very fast quench. Um, um, so you can do a water quenched uh, uh, with circulating water, with still water. You can do oil quenches, and and, and these are less severe. Okay, but what, so let's have a look at the meaning. How do you, how do we transpose our um, Jomini? Uh, test results uh, with, with, um, the, uh, with actual uh, 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 information that we can use in practice. Huh? So um, we just knew that it is 8640. Uh, yes, it gave me 50% of martensite at a distance of about half an inch away from the end. Yeah? So what is this in terms of a cylindrical bar, which is what I'm interested in? if I'm making uh, crankshafts, for instance. Uh, well, uh, this is the end. So here on the uh, x-axis, I have distance from the quenched end. Yes. And then uh, here I have bar diameter. So for uh, what we usually want to have in, um, in these... Uh, uh, engineering steel products, we want to have 50% of martensite at the center of the bar. Yes, this is a, um, a relatively normal situation. Okay, so that's if that's in case you're wondering why I'm focusing on 50% and not 100%. Right? So usually you uh, you try to achieve uh, you know a hard outer se uh, surface and then a much more ductile and tougher center, which consists about 50% of martensite. Okay, so, um, so as I said, a half, a micro, a half an inch corresponds to something slightly larger than a, a, a centimeter. Uh, uh, okay, so now if I do an ideal quench, yes, uh, this corresponds to a bar, yes, Yes, of um, slightly larger than uh, eight centimeters, so 3.5 inches. Yes, bar. I can, uh, if I quench the outer surface with a jet of water. Yes, yes, that will be a 3.5 inch diameter bar that I can have that will have 50% of martensite in the center. Yes. However. If I cool, not for reasons of cracking and shape distortion, I cool with oil instead, yes? The cooling rate will be much smaller, yes? Now, I still want a bar with 50% in the middle, okay? How large the diameter, will the diameter be, yes? Well, it, it will not be um, eight uh, centimeter diameter bar, but it will be a little bit less than four, so half the diameter, okay? Remember, yes, this is function of the composition, okay? This is function of the composition. So for instance, this guy here, in order to have 50% of martensite, I can 
very, very large, very, very large distances from quenched end. So also very large bar diameters. I can quench very large bar diameters even if I quench very moderately in oil. Yes? Okay. Now, let's compare now with uh, 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 the, the unalloyed steel that we had, 1040, right? So this, this was the, um, the Jomini hardness profile. Uh, I can see here, <coughs> excuse me, where I have 50% of martensite, yes? That is here at this very low thickness, yes? Very, very, cl uh, very close to the quenched end, yes? Right? So now I, I use this data, yes? This point here, this point here is the same as this point, yes? Say I quench with even ideal quench, yes? you can see that the thickness, the, sorry, the, the diameter will be less than two centimeter or, or even, even much less if I, do, if I do very moderate quenching with oil. So I cannot, there are many products I will not be able to make with this steel, yes, because I will never have enough hardness hmm, in the bar. Hmm. So 1040 is, is not a, hardening, a hardenable steel and you will never see anything being made with this steel, okay? okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So this typical product, yes. Um, the uh, there are alternative ways in which you can find hardenability data presented. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for instance, uh, you don't necessarily have to have uh, uh, Rockwell data, yes? Uh, you can have, for instance, uh, hardness, Vickers hardness measurements instead. Um, um, and in the uh, axis here, instead of having, for instance, a distance, um, what uh, people, the, the, the hardena hardenability data that they present mm, uh, may be Vickers hardness as a function of what's called the log of T8 slash 5. Yes? What, what does that mean? Yeah? Uh, this means T8, the log of T850 means the log of the cooling of the time in the temperature range of 800 to 500 degrees C. Yes? So the time it takes to cool from 800 to 500 degrees C. Yes? So the log of this, this time is actually a measure of the cooling rate. And when this time is short, it's a high cooling rate. If this time is long, it's a low cooling rate, yes? And as a consequence, you can see that the hardness data will go from high to low as this time increases. Yeah? Why do people choose 800 to 500? Well, that's because for most steels, that's the range where you have the, 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 the transformations occur, yes? So a steel, yes? Um, which is um, uh, very hardenable, yes, will have a, a harness curve that looks like this. Hmm? That means um, even at low cooling rates, at low cooling rates, I, I have a high hardness, yes. Hmm? Um, elements which um, have less carbon, for instance, or have less alloying elements, so are not as hardenable, will, will have S-curves that look like this. So the data look, will look different, and you, you use it differently also in, in practice. But it's equivalent to this Jomini approach, yes? So usually engineering steels, 
uh, if you want to use them, you, you need to have hardenability data available, yes? Which is usually published uh, by the, the company that makes these engineering steels, yes? There are also ways in which, yes, you can do some calculations yourself. Hmm? Let's go back to this uh, previous uh, graph here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Remember that we uh, try to determine the diameter, yes, of a bar where we would get 50% of martensite in the center in the case of ideal cooling. Yes? This particular um, uh, diameter is called the ideal diameter. Yes? That's the ideal diameter. This, this particular point. And uh, people have uh, determined yes, what this um, di is. The, the maximum diameter for 50% uh, martensite at the center in the case of ideal um, quench conditions. And ideal quench conditions are defined as the, the bar, the surface, the temperature at the surface of the steel is equal to the, the temperature of the coolant you're using, basically water at room temperature. Hmm? Yes? And so they've come up with a formula, yes, which is uh, the following, a, t uh, a, a diameter which is a function of C, austenite grain size, and the severity of the cooling. So this is DC. This is a tabulated value. It's, it's tabulated on the basis of uh, Lots of experiments, yes, we'll, we'll see how it looks like. And then there are factors, factors which are a function of the composition. So, for instance, if I have a steel composition, yes, a certain steel composition, certain grain size, still carbon content, yeah, um, this is just an example here, uh, this would be 14, yes, and then I have these parameters which are a function of the composition, and I find an ideal diameter, okay? Okay. What does this mean? Is that if you are a manufacturer of crankshafts, for instance, for cars, yes, and you, so you, of course the steel maker doesn't doesn't sell you crankshaft. The steel maker sells you bars, and you can do with it what you want, yes. Mm -hmm. But when you purchase uh, bars, uh, you need to specify the composition. Not because you like this, but because you want to make sure that when you do a thermal treatment of your crankshafts, there's 50% of martensite in the center. Yes? So certain uh, companies will, uh, when they order steels, engineering steels, they will also specify what the DI has to be. Yes? So the, the, the company does not only have to give a specific chemical composition, but the chemical composition has to give them guarantee the DI value. Yes? So if you make crankshafts um, for, for instance, big marine motors, yes, they're much larger, yes, you will have to, you know, the composition will have to be just so that you can make sure it's hard enough, strong enough. It has enough martensite at the center. So let's just have it, I'll just go that, show this quickly. Um, this method is developed by a person called Grossman um, some time ago, and that's, it's, it's also known as Grossman hardenability prediction method, yes? And it's important um, and, and used and widely used to uh, specify compositions. Hmm? Uh, so, so, um, so remember, uh, we want to determine uh, two factors, di, yes, 
And then you have, also have DC. Yeah? In order to determine DI, I, I need to first have this parameter DC. Uh, and, and DC is based is function of carbon content, austenite grain size, and, and factors uh, for multiple elements. So s say I have an example here. It's a steel with 0.3 carbon, 1.1% manganese, 0.4 silicon, uh, 0.4 chrome, and 0.3 molybdenum, and it has a grain size of six, which is 40 uh, microns. So so this is the, this is the graph that you would use to determine um, DC, or in this case it's called DIC, but, but this is DC actually. So you may want to change this. Uh, this is the DC in the previous formula. Okay, so what do I get? Uh, what is the carbon content? 0.3. What my ASTM uh, 6 means that uh, that's related to the grain size, so I, I use the 6, the curve 6 here, yes, and, uh, and that's basically it. I, I, I read off the graph 14, yes, 14, okay? And then the alloying elements, usually alloying element will, will slow down the kinetics of many decomposition reactions, very often because when I have a decomposition reaction, these elements need to change place. For instance, they need partition to the austenite, or they need to partition to the ferrite. So that will slow down the kinetics. Yes. So, um, uh, right. So these factors again. Uh, this is not based on any theory. It's just based on um, um, uh, lots of measurements and, and then empirical uh, fits of the data to these measurements. So say, for instance, I have 1% of manganese. What is this factor here for manganese? 1% of manganese. I find the manganese curve, and the factor is 2 point something, 2.2, yes? Do the same for silicon, etc., and I find uh, this ideal uh, diameter. Hmm? So what does, what does, it, it, what does it mean? Yeah? If, I, if I have this composition, a bar, of 67 uh, millimeter will have 50% of martensite at its core, guaranteed, yes, after an ideal quench, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, if I have a non-ideal uh, uh, quench mm -hmm. with um, H value of, for instance, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, for instance, because I'm using oil, this diameter will be smaller, yeah, but be about, in this particular case, 30 uh, millimeters, but that may be enough, okay? Okay, but the steel maker, the provider of the steel, uh, uh, has to uh, uh, give compositions that will guarantee this DC, DI uh, value, okay? Okay. Um, right, so this is an example here. So if, if we have a non ideal quench, so H instead of using uh, water sprays, yes, right on the surface. We use oil, for instance, and uh, say the oil is a circulating oil, so the oil is not a, it's not still, but it's a bath where there is some turbulence, yes, circulating. So my this uh, uh, diameter of the bar now it isn't going to be, it's not 67 anymore, but it's reduced to about three, yes because I'm using oil. And the severity is different. Yeah? Okay? And again, nothing changes on the X scale, right? X scale, because the X scale, for instance, in this particular case, is the Jomini, the results of the Jomini test. Okay? Okay. Right? Um, now, um, important if you ever get, there's not much research in engineering steels, um, at GIFT, one of the reasons is, of course, because a um, big group like POSCO doesn't really produce lots of engineering steels, yes? They, uh, they do produce bars, but it's not uh, a big, uh, uh, well, it, it, it is a sizable production, but it's not uh, a huge amount of production. In that area, they tend to produce uh, rather standard grades. There's not much research in this area. but. Um, you know, people who are into engineering steel research, they uh, bar steels in particular, 
um, uh, will you know have been working on improving this Grossman methods. Uh, so, um, and, and these are uh, some of the uh, latest um, uh, uh, graphs that are being used to um, to determine these multiplying factors for carbon and for um, other alloying elements. Yeah? And they may be slightly different than the, the original ones in the, in the gross methods. Okay? Um, important um, is also combinations of um, alloying elements. Some alloying elements have a big impact on the uh, multiplying factors of certain alloying elements. For instance, boron. Boron has, this is the so-called boron factor, the boron multiplying factor, is if, uh, if it's between three to three and a half. So let's go back to, uh, oops, this way. To some, yeah, okay, here you have multiplying factors. Yeah? And you can see here, so in this range here, yeah, what the, not many elements that have high um, multiplying factors. Yeah? But molybdenum is one. So molybdenum is, is, is indeed an alloying element you see a lot in engineering steels. Chromium, manganese, okay? These three elements. Yeah? Nickel, nothing really important. Uh, the other thing that's important, in order to have large effects uh, uh, for chromium, you will have to add um, high contents, 1.2%, 2%. For molybdenum, around 1%, yes, to have pronounced effects. Yeah? Not so with boron. Boron is already very efficient at extremely low contents, like 20 ppm, yes, very, very low. Hmm? However, and, and the reason is very simply, because in the austenite, boron segregates to gr grain boundaries. And this is an austenite grain boundary. Boron atoms sit here. And when they do that, they prevent, remember, uh, when austenite transforms to ferrite, when austenite transforms, so just say this is no boron, yes? When austenite transforms to ferrite, the ferrite forms at the grain boundaries of austenite. That's where it forms, yes? And, 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 and the ferrite grains then grow basically, yes? There's no ferrite formed in uh, recrystallized austenite, no. If we have boron, boron suppresses, suppresses ferrite nucleation. So ferrite nucleation of ferrite suppressed. So what does it mean when you suppress the formation of a, a phase? You basically, the, the, trans, the C curve is, is moved backwards. It's moved to the right. And so you make the steel very hardenable with very small amounts of, of uh, boron. However, however, when you add carbon, hmm, this very high hardenability of boron decreases a lot, yes? And for instance, if you have about 0.8 carbon, so that means when the steel is perlitic, hmm, hmm, when the steel is perlitic, the multiplying factor is one, so that means the boron has no effect, right? Okay, so, so what's, what's the reason? Well, the reason is because when you add carbon, carbon and boron compete for these grain boundary sites, segregation sites. Yes? And so uh, if you have enough carbon, 
the boron will be replaced by carbon in the grains, the grain boundaries, excuse me. And so you will, again, allow ferrite formation at the grain boundaries. And the effect of boron, the hardening effect of boron, will disappear. Okay? So very careful here um, when um, you're adding elements. Some elements may neutralize the effect of the others. Huh? So never add a lot of boron in a steel that contains a lot of carbon because you may as well not add it yeah? uh, for, for reasons of um, 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 hardenability. All right, well, let's, let's have a look at some, um, how, how we uh, can uh, make steels by playing around with um, these, um, the, the kinetics of the transformation. So remember, um, we will look at, uh, so, so when, when we transform steels, we have the C curves for the nucleation and growth type of transformation, and then the horizontal lines for athermal time-independent transformation or decomposition to martensite. So let's look at, uh, uh, so these curves, where they are, yes, and how they are shaped is composition dependent. And these parallel lines, their position is composition dependent, yes? So let's have a look at if we do the first cycle, yes, 300, we, we cool to 350 very quickly, then hold for 10,000 seconds at 350, and then we cool to room temperature. What do we get? Austenite to 350. Here, after 10 seconds, the transformation starts. Transformation is below this nose, and we know that's bainite, yes. We also know that if we keep at very long temperatures, at very long times, excuse me, at the same temperature, we get spherodite, spheroidite. Um, and so at 50, uh, excuse me, at 100 seconds, it's 50% transform. A little, about 200 seconds, we get 100% transform. Then nothing much happens, yes, till we cool down. We cool down to room temperature, so um, we pass MS and MF temperature. But does anything change? No because the, transfer, the, the microstructure is fully transformed already, right? So no, this doesn't really have any meaning, huh? Okay, so this is the microstructure that you get, fully benetic. Let's do um, um, another cycle, 250, 100 seconds, and then we cool to room temperature. We cool down to 250, hold it for 200 seconds, and then cool to uh, room temperature. So what happens here? Well, really nothing happens to the austenite at this point. Nothing. It's just there, yes? Although it's very, very unstable, yes? It has a, it's a very large driving force for transformation. But um, we have such low temperatures that um, there's not, even if we form small nuclei, there's no growth of, um, in that particular case would be bainite, Okay, so there's nothing really happening, yes? We say austenite is metastable, yes? And then after 100 seconds, we cool down, and then we'll form fully martensitic microstructure in this particular case. And there's no reason to make more complex um, uh, uh, thermal uh, treatments. For instance, cycle three, you cool to 360, stay there at 10 seconds, cool to 400, Hold 1,000 seconds, and then cool to room temperature. So you, the, you go here, austenite. If you transform for 10 seconds, I will form 50% will be perlite, yes? Because I, I have reached the 50%, yes? So now I'm left with 50% austenite. I cool down, yes? And I do the transformation. It's a bainite transformation. And when I cool down, so I will have 50, cool down to room temperature. Again, the fact that I pass MS and MF temperature has no effect because the, the transformation is finished. Yeah, and I get 50% perlite and 50% bainite. 
Now, you may think this is all academic and it's all very funny and uh, easy to understand, and, but, uh, but, but it's actually used in practice, yes? And, in, and there are furnaces uh, and lines that produce large amounts of steels, uh, special steel microstructures this way. Hmm? For instance, this is a line here, an industrial line, which uh, is designed by a famous company, German company. They're, they're all, all over the world, but it's, uh, it's called Ebner. They're a very famous uh, furnace builder. And it's a, it for uh, the um, thermal treatment of narrow strip. Yeah? If you wonder what, what narrow strip is, are, these are, are products that are narrow, there's steel, they obviously have been sheet-like at one time, but the product is narrow. What's a, a narrow strip product? If you work in gardening, and many tools are narrow strip products, for instance, saws, you know, the saws, they're based on the narrow strip products. Um, so saws would be, for instance, made with a, a line like this, the microstructure. Hmm? So you come in with um, these strips, so you, this is a coil, this narrow strip, so it's a small strip, long strip of um, steel. Hmm? Um, and uh, so you uncoil it and you get these strips that move into this, this machine here. And this machine is basically, a, uh, allows you to do thermal treatment of narrow strip. Hmm? So for instance, and you can set it up to make different types of uh, heat treatments. Yes, anything you can think of is in principle possible. So for instance, this is the structure to do house tempering. House tempering is a, a, a word that's often used for, for bainitic transformation. So you, uh, so you have an house tempering furnace. And then you do a liquid metal quench. Liquid metal quench is a is very interesting way to quench a material at high temperature. So if you want to, if I ask you, you, want to, you need to quench a steel, but you need to quench it at room temperature, you'll say, well, I would take a, I go to the faucet, make, put some water in it at room temperature, and then throw my steel in there, right? So it's, it's going to cool to room temperature. But if I ask you, I want you to quench it to 400 degrees C, then you say, well, I can't use water, right? Because I would want have vapor and my water would be gone, yeah? Or I, you say, well, I could make a furnace, maybe. A furnace at 400 degrees C. That would be a good idea. Um, but you'd have to make sure it's homogeneous. Another way to do this is to use liquid salts. Yeah, salts, but they're very aggressive. So, but you can also use liquid metals, like lead. Like you melt lead, yes. It's, it's used, it's, uh, so you can heat it up. It doesn't evaporate, and it's very flexible. So you can use liquid metals. Liquid metals are, are used very often to do uh, uh, things like this. So you, uh, you can use a metal quench. Yeah. Um, and so you get a nice isothermal temperature. That's, that's the important thing, right? You want to have the way you, I just described it, nice isothermal treatments yes, uh, that you can control. There's a leveling furnace to get uh, uh, you know, uh, the strip at the right temperature, hmm? and then you have a tempering uh, furnace, and then finally you cool the strip, and then you coil it up again. Hmm? And so th this will allow you to, um, so you austenitize the first segment, yes, then you, you cool down to the quench, yes, keep the temperature, uh, and then you, you do the final jet cooling. Hmm? You can change it, you can, maybe you want to make mar martensite. And maybe you want to, uh, uh, often with martensite, the microstructure is, is very hard. So you want to make it slightly more ductile by precipitating some of the, uh, carb the carbon as carbides. So you do, you temper the, the martensite. So again, th this way, you, this is the same line, except the parts have been changed. So, so you have, you can austenitize, liquid metal quench, a uh, strip cooler, a leveling surface, uh, furnace, tempering furnace, jet cooling, and then you coil the strip. So what you do here, again, you austenitize the material, you quench it, hmm? then you need to 
uh, get nice homogeneous temperature. You reheat it in the tempering furnace, yes, and then you jet cool it, okay? So you can do this on the strip continuously. Okay. So um, this is an example, uh, just an example, was for a, um, a heat treatment of a strip. Um, bar steels can also be uh, uh, treated. So, For instance, here you quench and tempered um, special uh, bar products, yes? So in this case, what you see it is the bar product is basically a cylindrical rod, yes? And you see here what happens. The cylindrical rod has been made, yes? And now we're going to heat treat it. So we pass it through a series of inductin inductors, which do the induction heating. You can see the bar is very high temperature, yes? And then we pass it through this, this, this is a box here, yes, a box here. Mm -hmm. And in this box, this is in the interior, you see quenching sprays. Mm -hmm. And the, they quench the, the bar to uh, room temperature. Mm -hmm. And then the bar passes through a second set of induction, induction heaters. Now you don't see the bar uh, being uh, bright yellow, yes, because the quenching temperature is typically, depending on the application, maybe three, four hundred degrees C. Yeah? Um, uh, so so you, you, you pass it through a second uh, set of uh, inductors to do the tempering, and then you do a final quench. So you can, uh, this, these processes are not uh, limited to just um, um, uh, sheets, narrow sheet. You can apply this to bars. Um, I'm going to skip this uh, just a second. Yes, and even extremely large forgings are, um, are heat treated. Mm -hmm. For instance, this is a, 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 an ingot here, and, and here it's being forged in an open die forging. You can see it's a huge forging. Yes, again, uh, forging here. Eventually, um, uh, you make uh, this. Um, uh, I think it's a, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a, um, the, um, a turbine shaft here, yes. This is also heat treated, and you can see here the, the, the excuse me, the, the heat treatment. You see here this very large shaft is being uh, put in, in a quenching bath, yes, to, to, to harden it, basically. Okay. Now, the, let me just finish this, I, um, so we don't. The the problem with many um, heat treatments is that they're they're complex, yeah? heating, cooling, yes, and um, and lots of us are fixated, obsessed by by thinking that strength. You need to have complex microstructures, yes. Uh, it's not always like that, yes? Mm -hmm. For instance, we were talking about um, crankshafts. Yeah? In the past, many crankshafts used to be made with uh, pretty complex uh, so-called conventional quench and tempering methods. So you would, you would forge the, the, the you, you start with the bar, so you do, we have to forge the shape, yes? And then you would do a quenching, you would have to temper it. These heat treatments would result in some distortion, so you would have to um, you know, um, correct the shape, yes, and do some stress relief, yes. Nowadays, so you can imagine how many furnaces this means, yes, and how complex the whole operation is. Nowadays, we don't use these steels anymore, for a large part. We use so-called vanadium microalloyed ferrite plus perlite steels. Yes, and the, the heat treatment is very simple. You just hot forge the material and then do controlled cooling. That's it. Very simple. And you get very good properties. Yes? So, um, and that's also part of um, you know, doing steel research or products research in general. It doesn't mean you know, making things very difficult or very complex. 
It may mean very often that when you uh, be successful in innovation means being able to find solutions that are very elegant and simple. Yes, this is one of these. Um, so these steels can be hardened by simple controlled air cooling. Yes, there's no additional heat treatment uh, required except the ones that you always have to do which are related to carburizing where you, 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 you uh, harden the, the, the surface, okay? And the, the reason why you'd, you'd say, well, how can you do soft coolings and you know, get hard materials, you know, get equivalent strength as, as you know, what you had to do previously, uh, and, uh, get Martin side. Well, basically, because you micro-alloy the steels. You add vanadium and some higher nitrogen content, and that forms precipitation hardening uh, particles and these are very very effective to uh, get high strength yes you can see here what the amount of vanadium uh, is that you need we're not talking about huge amounts either so the impact of this the addition of vanadium which is not a cheap alloying element is is relatively mild because you you have a much less complex process a much cheaper process and um, a very slight increase in the alloy uh, price by as a result of the, the vanadium. Okay, so um, you know, complex. It's important to understand um, the complex of uh, phase diagrams and kinetics of transformation. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you know when you design steel, you have to make it necessarily difficult. You know, sometimes simple and elegant solutions are uh, used in the industry. Yeah? Okay. So I'm a little bit over time. Thank you for your uh, patience with that. And um, so we'll see each other on Thursday. Okay. We st um, just so you know, we, we start with you know, 10 to 15 minutes um, quiz. And then for the next weeks, from then onwards, we'll, we'll repeat this uh, every week. OK, see you then. Uh, yes, and also have a look at the uh, E-class because I will post the, the new uh, corrected um, slides, okay?